Okay, so we're going to pick up where, where we left off on uh, the last episode, uh, and uh, we're going to be covering the uh, hypernative security uh, partnership and what they do and how they do it, because I was really curious about, okay, how do they do it uh, in, a, in a minute here, but w there's some breaking news that uh, happened really recently within the last, I'd say, 24 hours here on April 21st, 2024, and so we're going to get to that first. But to stay tuned, and then we'll jump into the hypernative discussion and a bunch of other things that we, we want to cover. Carl, welcome back. And what news broke internationally and, and what's going on? Yeah, thank you for having me, William. We've been waiting for this moment, basically the moment I call the capitulation moment, where the king gives us the keys to the castle. So let me explain. Yesterday, the IMF says that now um, Bitcoin is a must have in order to uh, protect people across the globe from fiat. Now, this is pretty odd considering they're the sales staff for TradFi. They're the kings to the castle. They're, look, we know where this heads. This is why we're in crypto. We knew long, long time ago where this goes. They need the private cryptos. Don't let them fool you. They don't have some magic rabbit that they're going to pull out of the hat. They need other cryptos, not just Bitcoin. In fact, I'm going to get into a major discussion, if William don't mind, about the role Bitcoin is going to have, especially when it comes on flare, because we all know proof of work is going to get so congested that the only way out for proof of work is to lock it up on chain and then come over on Flare and expand its use case. <laughs> in, in other words, folks, I don't care what the IMF says. I never have cared. The bottom line is they need Flare too, not just Bitcoin. Yeah, okay. you know, you know, the irony of that whole IMF announcement is the IMF is, like you say, they're they're the king of fiat, but they've been the promulgators of fiat, and now for them to say that, boy, that's a flip, a big flip. But I wonder if this other big news helped with that announcement, and that was the announcement that the eight point four billion dollars in deposits left Wells Fargo and Citigroup in the last year. Of course, the rhetorical question is. Where'd that money go? But that, and you could talk about that, but think about fractional reserve for a second and the impact on those institutions. 38.4 billion in deposits is the same as 10 times that, or 384 billion in lost market capitalization of those institutions. That's like a, a kick in the gut. So, is there no wonder why the IMF is now warning third world countries, oh my gosh, you better have crypto because fiat's on its way out or something? What? How do you react to that, Carl? The IMF is the lender of last resort. They have the most liquidity out of anybody because when central banks get into trouble, they go to the IMF for a loan. Well, dot, 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 all of a sudden now you're a big proponent of Bitcoin and you're telling everybody what we already knew anyway, which is hyperinflation is coming for fiat. The dollar is turning into the very last domino, as we've already spoke about numerous times, that, yeah, it's got a lot of wiggle room because it is the reserve currency. And everybody knows that as well. If you're in any other foreign country, you're going to want to use dollars, let's face it, because your own state has failed you, and the dollar is a way for you to protect yourself against your own currency's hyperinflation. But what if you live in the United States? See, you don't yeah. have that hedge because you're stuck in the dollar. You're literally stuck. You have no alternative fiat to run to, but you have Bitcoin, see? <laughs> so, yeah, well, yeah, and not only are you stuck, you're legally stuck. It's your legal tender, folks. Uh, look at your dollar bill, pull it out and read it, where it says, this note is legal tender for all debts 
public and private. There it is. You're locked in, kid. That's what you have to use by order of the king. You know, and I, we, ladies and gentlemen, we were talking offline and, and Carl brought up Thayer's Law, which is really cool. Do you mind if I go into that, Carl? No, second? go ahead. Okay, there's Gresham's Law and Thayer's Law. So Thayer's Law is the monetary principle that states that good money will drive out bad money. And the opposite of that is Gresham's Law, which states that bad money drives out good. Now, Gresham's Law came first because Gresham some time ago did a study of the, the history of money, where it was gold back from the Greeks, the Romans, all the way through the Renaissance, all these periods where people would try to cheat on the gold coin. They'd hold the gold coin and they instituted the silver coin. You little people, you use silver. And then the silver people would start shaving off the edges of the coins to devalue it. And they'll, oh, no, oh, we, we need to have copper coins now so people won't be shaving off the silver. So the whole Gresham's Law thing was based that the bad money would drive out the good. So the good money, the gold and the silver, would go up to the elite. And the bad money, the copper, the zinc, you know, the barter would go to the poor people. And that was a resulting of economic collapses in feudal systems, feudal times, the Roman Empire, you know, all that stuff. Here we have, we're in the new era of fiat currency and legal tender, where you must use that note for all transactions, public and private. Well, Thayer's Law says that good money will drive out the bad. And so what's the good money now? The good money is crypto. And what's the bad money? The bad money is the one the government's forcing you to use by law, your legal tender. So we're really in this kind of a weird transition period. It's an upheaval, really. Well, the thing is, you people out there, things will move very slow until they don't move slow. They will move faster than you think. And if you take that comment by the IMF yesterday, if you really break it down, it look, they're throwing in the towel. They've, they're telling you what we've been telling you for a long time. You better get out of fiat, okay? They know bank runs are happening. They know that half of the world wants away from the dollar. This is all happening very fast. And what else just announced yesterday was BRICS. BRICS said specifically that they're going to start using cryptocurrency. Now, they didn't say what cryptocurrency, so they just left it blank and said cryptocurrency. Does it really matter? No. The bottom line is it's private cryptos, and we all know that Bitcoin has always been the doorkeeper to fiat. In other words, everybody's going to pump Bitcoin, but then they're going to take profits and it floods down to the altcoins. And then the altcoins actually have the bigger rise in value because they're risk on. People, please understand, we are entering a very pivotal moment right now. BRICS is trying to introduce this multipolar world where they want to trade with each other and break the, the chokehold of U.S. sanctions and sanctions from the West and this kind of territorial imperialism stuff. But the handwriting's on the wall about this the system being is, broken. The thing is, it's not just bricks. It's the United States' very own citizens that are trying to escape this crappy devaluation of our currency. We have to protect ourselves from our own government. So how are we doing this? Same thing as BRICS. They can hire as many IRS agents as they want. It's not going to matter. There's going to be an onslaught of people exiting the dollar and into crypto. It is a live bank run, folks. We are having a live bank run right now. And that, if I can, I'd like to dovetail into the next topic. Because yeah, it, go ahead. It, it dovetails into it. And that brings up the topic of security that we were wanting to talk about last week. A, a partner working with Flare, and they offer services 
of, of det uh, AI based detection uh, on chain to preemptively analyze, detect, and report possible attacks on, on various chains. So if you go to their uh, website, hypernative.io, uh, you can scroll down and, and read up on it. But I just want to basically cover uh, just a few things, because when I first heard about this, the first thing I was thinking was, OK, how does it work? How do they preemptively determine an attack vector? That's really important. But uh, on their website, that they're boasting that they have 764,000 risks detected. There's over 33,000 alerts triggered. And they also have 1,443 monitored protocols. This, this is pretty, pretty impressive. And as far as how, how they did it, I had to drill around into the uh, blog to, to, to find out, a, to find a description of how they, how they do this AI modeling. There is a blog post on the hypernative.io website that's titled Exploits, Hacks, and How We Detect Them. It doesn't get into the details, but it does uh, do a description uh, of some of the hacks that they detected. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview here of some of these attacks. So the, in the Audius attack, the attacker changed, they describe it as the attacker changed the voting system and approved a governance decision sending his own wallet six million dollars worth of audius tokens it took the audius team 25 minutes to detect the hack and two and a half hours to fix it hyper native could alert 17 minutes before the actual attack took place another attack the olympus dao where three hundred thousand dollars was stolen uh, they contacted the olympus dao and they confirmed uh, the attacks and, and there's several others and i won't go into them but when i read this i had to put together in my head they don't go into the details of how they use artificial intelligence to detect these attacks but based on the descriptions and what little i know and i know enough about artificial intelligence to be dangerous what i know about ai modeling is they've been analyzing these types of attacks for some time and they've built uh, a series of models in AI on their systems to do its own uh, consistent machine learning. So it's constantly running in the background, going from chain to chain, looking for these patterns. And these patterns will indicate a certain mm, trigger point where it rises to a certain threshold and then they are notified. Imagine, if you will, a, an Excel spreadsheet where you have columns and rows of information. Now make take then that's two dimensional. Okay, now in your mind make that three dimensional, four dimensional, ten dimensional, and then if you can imagine that where all these points are connected to each other, you can then see how fast artificial intelligence can make connections between all these different vectors. And I think that's how they're doing it. And, and I think they're going to be wildly successful. And we really need something like this to interactively and preemptively detect exploits, hacks on these on-chain. Because when these chains start to do real-world assets, the amount of scaling is going to explode. This model will explode with it. And that's the wonder of AI is it can uh, keep up with uh, an explosion and scalability where human beings can't. So this is really incredible technology built uh, in and on the Flare network. It's got huge potential. And um, forgive, well, my, forgive my metaphors on uh, how AI works, but in my mind, that's, that's the best explanation I, I can give a layperson. Hugo just did a presentation over at Token 2049 in Dubai, and he specifically was laying out the future of what he envisions AI to look like on Flare. And he's discussing consensus learning mechanisms and machine learning built on chain. Now, he is specifically focused on, I think it's two areas 
which is the bias that is present within AI currently. Yes. Obviously, if you're using Google Bard or you're using Chat GPT, those systems were created by a group of biased opinions. And those biased opinions need to be filtered out if we're going to adopt this AI language. Now, let me explain. We're not all in line with their opinions. So we need to keep things factual as we can. Now, what does that look like on Flare? We can pretty much figure it out if those things have a way in which to sort out. And they're working on it. They're absolutely working on it. And getting back to hypernative, the various exploits, and as you said, there's going to be a lot of different AI models to handle different exploits that will be specifically targeted for certain vulnerabilities. Yeah, yeah you, you're going to have one specific program alone just to handle one specific way that a person could come in and, like you said, the, the vulnerabilities. So that's going to evolve. And I am sure Hypernative is going to address those as they become known. This is going to get better and better. And, and isn't that what we want on a chain that can continue improvements across the board? The days just hodling some token are over. We're talking about cops on the beat that are really artificial intelligence. Yeah, I would extend that. The counter to that in the future is going to be the hackers themselves are going to want to use their artificial intelligence to look for vulnerabilities. So you're going to have actually AI versus AI, just like AI being able to detect deep fakes. The only way to detect a deep fake made by an AI is to have an AI identify it as a deep fake. So this is where it's going to go. But that's okay. You got to have cops on the beat, and there's always going to be bad guys. The thing is, the bad guys, they want the low hanging fruit. Right. So if they know that Flare Networks is deploying a lot of this technology that Hypernative is suggesting, they're probably not going to pull some crap over here on Flare. They're going to go over on some other chain, and where the low hanging fruit is. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's all about the cost of exploiting. If the cost of exploiting is low, you right. take it. If the cost is too high, you go elsewhere. Yeah, so it's turning out to be a pretty interesting couple oh. of weeks. So if I may go from the sublime to the mundane. Recently, I was doing my weekly check on Flare Metrics to try to pick and choose my best delegator of, of the week or the two weeks. And I noticed that the red exclamation mark, which was the easy way to detect if somebody was greater than two and a half times or a percent over delegated has disappeared. Now, does that mean that the top 10 are doing a better job of managing their over delegation or did Flare Metrics decide, oh, maybe we shouldn't be sticking that exclamation mark out there, making people do their own math. Do you know anything about that, Carl? I'm just curious about it. Not because like I've spoke to you before, I have a couple that I delegate to and that I state to that I just know they're good actors and I'm really not that concerned to getting the best value possible out of my delegation or staking. I'm more interested in just dealing with good actors. That's mm -hmm. about it. I The money is not even, I'm really not looking at that, okay? In fact, I've participated in a couple actors just to help them out, you know, who they are and whatever. But my point is, look, we're here for the long term. And as far as rewards are concerned, rewards, guys out there, please listen to what I'm saying. Rewards will get trumped by price appreciation. Well, you got that right. It, you're you're going to look back and you're going to say, wow, I was really getting fantastic rewards, but the token just did a, a 100x. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, but I uh, like you take take a look at liquid staking's coming now. Do you want yeah. to talk about that? I was going to ask you about that liquid staking. Now, is Scepter really sanctioned or approved by Flare? Or here's the deal: Flare obviously has partnered with Kinetics, right? Yeah. But Kinetics is more of a marketing team. Let me explain. They have partnered with lots of various different team members to do different things, like Rome Blockchain, like with Enosis. They partnered with Scepter. They partnered with who's some of their other partners. So they, they, they're going to have their lending apparatus, their lending borrowing apparatus, but they're also partnering with ways to to reward those that come on without them losing their value as a staker, let's say, or as a delegator. So this just adds one more layer of utility for Flare, the token. Because now Flare is going to be able to get what's called the the S. <laughs> and yeah, you, you might want to think of this is another way of S assets, right? But it's really going to be an S Flare that's going to allow us to earn yield and still earn our yield by staking and delegating. And one more, flare drops. So we're going to get delegating rewards. Well, eventually we're going to get all the above. Right now we don't get the delegation rewards while we stake. But eventually we will. We haven't reached phase three yet of staking. We're still in phase two of the staking on Flare. Yeah, and uh, speaking of being on the edge of price appreciation, we're now at the latter 10 days or so of April, and we're all anticipating F assets going onto the Coston network. And I understand that the sequence of events is F assets will go on Coston or Coston 1. Then it's supposedly going to Songbird, then to Coston 2 yep. before it goes to Flare. And yep. I, I I hope that users uh, start to participate. When it goes to Coston, there'll probably be an interface and some documentation. And we'll cover this when it happens uh, here on the podcast to give people a heads up. But I think it's going to be really good that we participate in that and just do so I'm much. Sure that, I'm sure of that hyper native is going to participate because there's bounty rewards for those that can break the system. They actually want us to try to hack or break the F asset system. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, there, absolutely. There's bounties for those that succeed because they don't want to break the system when it's live, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, we don't need a, an AMM adventure here. I'm sure Hypernative's going to be involved in that progression in some shape or form. I don't know what it is, but yeah, there's vulnerabilities. We know what they are. They Some of these developers, they're exposed to various um, spyware and infiltrating their devices or computers. And then those exposures go right directly to the application. So there's vulnerabilities like ongoing. Now, how these developers are currently protecting their own devices, I have no idea. Their own inputs that are obviously vulnerable. That's why I'm I strictly only have one input device. I don't connect a bunch of wallets. In fact, I actually had someone from Utah that continues to try to hack my Coinbase account. Guess what? I don't have any assets on Coinbase. I haven't used Coinbase in forever, and I don't have any wallets linked to my Coinbase account, or nor would I. So go ahead, have at it. There's also a bit of news this week that Binance BNB Smart Chain, with their API connecting to the Flare API portal. Oh, yeah. So there's, it looks like the developers are jumping on board. Oh, yeah, these F assets are going to be all over the damn place. In fact, that would be a layer cake move right there because 
you're going from Flair to, to, to Binance, that's smart contract to smart contract. That's a layer cake move or bridge and F assets are for non EVM chains like Bitcoin, um, XRP. So yeah, Binance, and I like I said in our last pie podcast, I actually am more excited about layer cake than I am F assets simply because anybody that is on a smart contract chain, they have experience. They, they're just experienced people working with DeFi applications. In other words, they're currently using their tokens to do this and to do that. You take XRP, Bitcoin people, they're experienced in hodling. <laughs> they're hodlers. Nothing against hodling, guys. I don't mind hodling, but it's really not a sophisticated way to use your tokens now, is it? No, it's the difference between waiting for the bus and driving your car. But I'll tell you, I got really excited when Flair said the team has a ton of Bitcoin. Thanks, Hugo. <laughs> Think about it. Think about this for a second. Whoever the VCs or you take the Flair team, okay? Let's say they do have a lot of Bitcoin. That They have a huge incentive to put their own Bitcoin to work. Come on. Sure. They can earn these secondary tokens, and some of them are quite scarce. But there's a lot of utility. They can put their Bitcoin in in, in, in a loan or a lending, yeah. right? But yes, we do love scarcity, don't we? So yeah, please, by all means, Flare Team, pump our bags with your Bitcoin because I know you want to lend it out. There's a lot of people that want to borrow your Bitcoin. And why not put your Bitcoin to use the same time you're making money on your Bitcoin, you're going to pump our bags, right? So yeah, come on, Team Flair, pump our bags. Yes, and that, that goes for all of you too. No, let me be a little more specific. IMF, you're totally welcome to get your Bitcoin that you said you wanted to have right. and pump our bags too, because you are the lender of last resort. And we already know, oh, hold on a minute, William. We already know that the IMF lends to countries. And what are countries adopting right now? Bitcoin. So IMF and fear listening, Miss Georgieva, you are welcome to pump my bags with your Bitcoin and loan that out very nicely, please. And thank you. Yes, finally, we got a, a international governmental bureaucracy that's actually helping save the world. That just makes me feel all warm and fuzzy. I really like being inclusive, don't you? Oh, absolutely. Diversity, inclusion, you betcha, baby. I'm an inclusive addict. I want to help the world. And we love our Bitcoin. So, yeah, William, this is just incredible news. And Bricks, you're welcome to pump our bags too, because we know you you really are looking at a different way of moving value across the network. You're moving commerce, you're moving a lot of oil, you're moving just a lot of commodities in general. And you need, you just said you need crypto. You didn't get specific, you need crypto. So crypto's our gig, William. Yep, yep. I don't want people out there to think that I hate the United States. That's not the case. No, okay. no, we, we want prosperity for everybody. No. This, this is not my fault that they don't know how to manage our money. Okay. Yep. So let me be clear. I'm a big patriot. Okay. But you got to understand they've been shipping our jobs overseas for decades now. And our money. They have been printing into oblivion and devaluing our currency and making it so that we can't keep our wages up with this inflation. Yep. And I've been a big fan of crypto for that reason for a long time. Amen, brother. Yeah, folks, we are patriots, dude. But the dollar is going to suffer terribly for those that hold the dollar assets. And us crypto people, we become... The new class. There's going to be a major shift in power in our own country. And 
it will be simply because of the reasons we've spoke. And that power will bring prosperity to, That's every, right. to everyone and get us out of this destructive debt cycle that's just killing us. That's right. Crypto is going to bring a lot of opportunity to a lot of people that need jobs, people that are struggling out there. Fiat is not going to help them. Okay. When we become in charge, we're going to have a lot of jobs. They're going to need loans. We'll borrow them. Come on. Yeah. Has anybody seen that picture of Detroit versus Dubai? Come on. Let's wake up, people. Yeah, seriously, let's wake up. I spent 35 years down there. I came from, my whole family's broke up. Half of those people down there are committing suicide. It's a really sad situation down there. Okay. And it's not just Detroit. You're talking about the whole Rust Belt is a wake of destruction. And to be honest with you, it, it was there before the West Coast fell. And the West Coast is clearly falling. Take a look at Philadelphia. Take a look at Milwaukee and Chicago. And it's not good out there, folks. It's not pretty what's happened to the automotive industry. Yeah, and it's no no coincidence. It is it is part of the pattern that the same time we got this news that we've all been talking about here, that Congress decided to pass that spending bill to keep those wars going, don't protect the borders, and don't do anything to help people in the U.S. The system is broken. The Washington people are addicted to that fiat spending cycle, and, and crypto is going to break it. Crypto is going to break that cycle and will free us all. So I know this sounds dire to a lot of people, but you know what, folks? There are better times coming. There is liberty coming. There, there is freedom coming. You just got to wake up. There, there's no laggards on this phone call, folks. <clears throat> we don't suffer from the lack of innovation on this phone call. We're not here because we're technically inclined. We're here because we have major experience in all these areas that we're speaking about. It's just not specific to crypto, okay? There's a big picture out here, and a lot of them, like Ra Raul Paul, call it the macro. Okay, so this is what we're doing. We're looking at the macro, okay? Right. Yeah, go ahead, William. No, I, I don't want this to go on too long, and I, we probably need to wrap it up. We're It's a Sunday, so I guess we're preaching to some people, but this is a message that people need to hear and think about, and that... There's going to be those who, who can't hear the message, but there's going to be those who can hear it and will really think about it. And that's all we're asking you to do. Just think about what we've said. You don't have to take our word for it or anything. Make up your own mind. But just please take a look around. And everybody pretty much admires the fact that we aren't salespeople selling hard wallets yep. with the link in the description. We're not shilling coins here. We don't, we don't, in fact, there is no crypto that I dislike. I, it's just not. I, you people that love meme coins, okay, fine. So what? The point I'm making is we're just fans of crypto here. Um, and Bitcoin is the king right now. And the kings of the castle have been turned over to Bitcoin. We already know that. And we also know that Bitcoin floods into the alts. We've always known that. And we also know that Flare makes a better Bitcoin and a better yeah, and, RP and, it, and a better Dogecoin and a better everything. The thing is, here's what the IMF is not telling you. They told you that they love Bitcoin or you should be, you should definitely hold Bitcoin. What they're not telling you, here's the big one, guys. You ready for this? The IMF is all about the green. Well, is, is, is Bitcoin green? No. Is Bitcoin going to be green? Yes. In fact, we already know, folks out there, if you're listening to me, that Bitcoin is suffering the same stuff as Solana. A lot of mean coin activity and NFT are spamming the network and bringing these networks down to their knees. But guess what? F-assets 
is going to lock up these tokens on chain. And when they come to Flare, they're free to go wherever they want at a very low green pace. <laughs> okay, so I just told you what the IMF did not want you to know. So shh. Yeah, yeah, keep it to yourself. <laughs> All right, folks. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us today, and we appreciate your love and patience, and, and we give you well wishes in return. So, until next time, Carl, thanks for being on. Thank you, William. All right, next time, folks. Bye bye. <laughs>